Well, I don't know about you, but 33 years later, I still get little chills from the opening riff there of the 1986 blockbuster Top Gun. And if you've seen it a thousand times like I have, you are quite familiar with this opening footage as it turns into the credits to the music to the story. But have you really thought about what you're seeing, what the aircraft are, what the flight deck personnel are doing, and what's happening on the flight deck? Well, that is what we will talk about here today on BVR Productions Behind the Scenes. Hello and welcome. My name is Vincent Aiello. I am your host. I'm also the host of the Fighter Pilot Podcast, which belongs in the BVR Productions family. And on that show recently, we featured episodes on the F-14 Tomcat and the A-7 Corsair. And we have an upcoming episode on the A-6 Intruder. So I thought I would use the opportunity with this behind the scenes to talk a little bit about all three aircraft. Now, as you are familiar, if you've seen any of our other behind the scenes movies. We always feature a popular YouTube video and in this case we're looking at Top Gun opening with 3.4 million views and we will leave a link to this in the show notes for this show that we are creating. Now as we move through the opening credits here with the black background you will see some names that might be familiar from episode 21. If you recall on The Real Viper our guest Pete Pettigrew talked about working with Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer and a few others. Now we will skip ahead till we get to the footage here and the lead in into the flight deck video itself. And the very first thing you will see is of course the star of Top Gun, the F-14 Tomcat. Now this was filmed on the flight deck of the USS Enterprise off the east coast of the United States, I think back in 1984, 1985. And already here now, you can see something that we talked about on episode 42 with the Tomcat, and that is the television camera system, or TCS, which aids in visually identifying other aircraft. As well here, and we'll get better shots of it later, but you can see the fuel tanks that SIF and Cosmo said are pretty much always mounted on the F-14 when you're operating at sea, and we'll get another view of those in a little bit. Here now you can see that A-7 that we talked about before, and this particular little bit of footage, you'll see it used quite a bit in this opening scene. You've got an F-14 in the foreground on Catapult 3, and an A-7 in the background on Catapult 4, and I believe they're going to put the A-7 in detention and launch it first, just based on the different bits of footage that they use. At any rate, you can see all the steam making its way down. That's just the steam catapult system and the vents and leaks from it. And of course, it's all being blown aft because the flight deck is under probably about 20 knots of wind, either naturally or from the carrier itself, in order to aid the launch of these aircraft. All right. So here comes the F-14 in the foreground, as we talked about before. Here you can see that launch bar, and in a second, you will see a holdback fitting, and we'll describe the difference between the two. Here you have some of the flight deck personnel. Here's the shuttle that the launch bar itself will mount into, and then here again you have an A7 in the foreground with its launch bar, and then over here to the right, you have an A6 intruder. All right, so... Of course, this guy is now folding his wings, so they took a bunch of footage that day, and my guess is in the editing process later, they just stitched together scenes that made it look compelling with its, you know, it's not really important, I suppose, that it made perfect sense to naval aviators and those of you who enjoy knowing what's accurate and what's not. Now, this would be one of your aircraft directors. If it wasn't so filtered, you would see this particular individual with a yellow flight deck jersey and a hat. And I want you to notice that when aircraft are being directed, they will always use two hands to do it. And I mention that because in a moment, you'll see someone just using one hand, this guy here. And my guess is, because we'll see this again in a few minutes, that he is directing whoever is operating the shuttle for the catapult for it to be retracted so that they can then connect it. Now, this is where I was telling you some of the distinction between the launch bar, which is on front of the shuttle, and the holdback fitting, which is on the back. If you recall, our guest on episodes 11 and 12, Pappy, who was at the time the big XO of the Carl Vinson, he talked about the differences of what the launch bar and the holdback do. And we'll see some examples of that here in this opening footage. All right, so they're making their way up to the catapult itself. Again, assuming that the A7 is going to go first, then the F-14 would keep its wings folded to make as much room as possible for the A7 to do its thing. All right, here now you have an example of the launch bar in place 
in the shuttle hidden by the name here and then the hold back on this side of it and again I would refer you to episodes 11 and 12 on the actual operation of those two systems. All right, so the reason I said earlier I thought the A7 would launch first is here now you have one of the troubleshooters and he has a thumbs up over here and a thumbs up up here which suggests that the aircraft has already done its wipeout and they've seen everything that they like to see and so they are happy, they being the troubleshooters, there's probably one over here on the flight deck edge as well and they are happy with what they see and so they can launch this A7 even though this F-14 is slightly forward of it on the flight deck, but the reason that's deconflicted is because, again, the F-14 will have its wings still folded up at that time. There you see an example of the jet blast deflector being raised up out of the surface of the flight deck, and of course that deflects the energy coming out of the, or exhaust I should say, out of the back of the engines up into the air instead of pushing something behind it, which we talked about on the F-14 episode and on a previous behind the scenes, we saw what happens either if they don't raise the JBD or as some viewers corrected me on certain aircraft carriers, they just didn't have JBDs on Cat 4 and so they just did not taxi aircraft behind them. So not sure what happened on that one, but that was the problem. Here again, Jim Cash, Jack Epps. I remember Viper mentioning their names as uh, people he worked with daily. And so this particular scene looks to me like an A7 with its wings folded. But, you know, uh, if it's compelling and it fits in in the editing process, they might not necessarily care uh, what is happening at that particular moment as long as it fits with the overall storyline. Now this is not a take tension signal but they show it right before the F-14A's Pratt & Whitney engines go into afterburner and what you'll see next is the flight deck petty officer there if you notice that he gives the two fingers and I assume that means a certain level of tension I never really did get fully briefed on what their jobs are but they sit over here and operate the catapult itself once the shooter tells them to but this guy is not the shooter this is a yellow shirt plane director and what he's doing is he is passing off control of someone he is taxiing to a different petty officer and they used it here to signify the launch in fact that is not the signal you would normally see we'll see an example of that in just a moment now as you recall when the audio is up this is where it turns into the danger zone by Kenny Loggins from the previous Harold Fultemeyer song and of course it's uh, very exciting here as the F-14s then begin to launch you can see they're going off the waste catapults here. Now remember earlier I talked to you about the one-handed control and this guy here is showing you with his one hand up, one hand down, and in fact you see the shuttle retracting. And that is I think what's happening in that particular scene. Here you have what I believe is the hose to start an F-14, an A-6, an F-16, of course it wouldn't be on the flight deck, and an EA-6B Prowler, and that is the Huffer hose. Now those aircraft I just mentioned do not have internal or self-contained starting capability so they require an external source and usually that is done with a hose that looks a lot like that. Now this next thing you're going to see, okay it went by a little too quickly, is the cat track hose. It's not even a hose, it's more like a rubber blocker. Now the catapult that the shuttle runs up has a track in it and when they're not doing flight operations they will put a rubber protector in there because they don't want FOD or foreign object debris going down into the catapult. And generally they will remove these well before the launch begins and again they probably had this raw footage and just thought it might be interesting here. And then this particular hose, I've been kind of wondering about this one, it looks to me like the small thin connector they might put on the aircraft if your inertial navigation system or INS does not uh, work well enough to get your own alignment. Sometimes they can give you an alignment from the ship. It could also be external electrical power, but I'm quite certain it is not the fuel hose because you will see that in this next scene coming up in a moment and that is much larger and in fact when it gets full of fuel then it becomes probably about six inches in diameter. Now these are your two grapes, so called, because they are in purple jerseys. And you can see that the hose itself is being dragged out. I doubt that the hose is very heavy. I mean, it's, it's pretty dense rubber, so it probably is. But what you have going here is they're working against the reel where the hose is kept, as well as, look at their pants, the uh, wind on the flight deck. Again, probably something like 20 knots, and you can see their uh, pants fluttering in the wind.
Now this is the young flight deck crewman who is installing the holdback fitting on the aircraft and you can see he gets a good leg workout creeping up next to the aircraft. And then there for a moment was another example of the fuel tanks that we talked about, almost always carrying two on the F-14. And then not particularly visible here, but between the two in the tunnel is where, as Sif told us, and Cosmo on the F-14 episode, where you would load the AIM-54 Phoenix as well as your air-to-surface ordnance later on, not when this footage was filmed. Now here you have the director getting this particular aircraft right perfectly in the spot and you'll see he holds fists and that is his way of telling the pilot to stop and it cuts from this scene but if it continued the next thing he would do is put an arm down bending it from the elbow and that would be the signal to lower the launch bar. You can see that the jet blast deflector is already raised and again I think this is probably an A6 intruder just based on the pylons and the fuel tanks. Here you have an F-14 landing on the back of the carrier and now you get a pretty good shot of the hook to eye that we talked about with our landing signal officers on episodes 13 and 14. And you also see the cross deck pennants or the wires or the cables all more or less equally titled or called there because that is what the F-14 or any landing aircraft is attempting to engage. Now here you have another view of the TCS. Here you can see the fuel tanks. Here in this little section would be the tunnel as we called it. Over here air to air missiles can be carried on the wing stations and then in this area you have what could have been the glove veins. Now the glove veins if they were still activated wouldn't be out in this scene anyway because in fact you would need to see those more in a transonic stage similar to this where the F-14 is going very fast with its wings tucked back and these were originally designed to come out and add stability during that transonic flight just as you're passing through the speed of sound but apparently they found that they didn't offer enough enough benefit and they were just a little bit too complicated in maintaining so they ended up getting rid of those on later models and even on the F-14A. Alright, so here you can see that cable being grabbed by the uh, hook and Here's your landing signal officers. I'm quite sure these are not actors. My guess is they just film the regular guys. And no kidding, they do watch the aircraft all the way to landing. Now, I had a recent listener question via email of how is it possible for the F-18 or the F-14 or any aircraft really to drive over these cables when it lands. And the reason it's possible is because the tires are sufficiently large enough that it's really not an issue. Plus, the cables are fairly small, about the size of a normal forearm. And then they're also held up on these like leaf springs on an old muscle car, let's say. And as the uh, tire runs over them, difficult to capture it, but you could see there for a moment that it was compressed. And that is what happens is it just pushes it down next to the flight deck and it's not really an issue at all. Superior engineering at work. Here are your landing signal officers. In this, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call a one wire. Here's the second, here's the third, here's the fourth. It sucks, whoever filmed this one probably got ribbed by his buddies for a long time over this. But hey, it does bring you to a stop. I've been there, it's embarrassing, but no big deal. It still brings you to a stop just fine. Now this scene, after I became a pilot, I've scratched my head over for years because I can't figure out what's going on here. My guess is this is some sort of glory hound and these guys are all watching because they know they're filming and he's trying to do something. But this is the aftmost starboard or right side when facing forward of the flight deck of the aircraft carrier. And this is the ladder lines of the landing area. And I'm quite sure this individual is inside of the foul lines as they're called. And this is, I, they show this when the aircraft grabs the wire and then he gets all excited. I've never seen this in over 705 arrested landings on five deployments. I have no idea what's going on here. I think they just filmed something funny and decided to throw it in because he gets a little bit animated here. And the other guy's like, uh, yeah, whatever. By the way, this guy is a shooter. What he's doing back here, I have no idea. But that is not who helps us land. It's the landing signal officers over on the what would be the viewer's right side or the port side of the ship. But, hey, it looks compelling. No big deal. Here goes an F-14 off the waist catapult, 
And over here now is an example of the weight board we talked about on our earlier aircraft episodes. Showing 34,000, my guess is that is probably for CQ, carrier qualification for an F-18. The other three aircraft we're talking about today are not that light. And you don't see any F-18s in the scene, but I imagine they were on the flight deck. All right, here you have an example of a KA-6 tanker intruder. And we'll talk more about that on our upcoming A-6 episode. And there you have the shooter showing the guy intention. There again is your petty officer on the side getting ready to launch. And then this does not fit in the scenes they were just showing because this is what we call the pickle. This is the landing signal officer and he holds that above his head until the flight deck is clear to land and then he lowers it at that time. And it's just a physical reminder that if the aircraft gets too close, he needs to wave him off before letting him come into land. Here's a great shot of the jet blast deflector at work and the F-14 going off the front. Now those guys, by the way, are also part of the catapult operating crew. And you can see how they are ducking down as the F-14 goes overhead. And no kidding, they are under the wings of the F-14. And that is probably about a hazardous as job as you can get. And that's right up there. They do it safely day in, day out on the flight deck right next to these 50,000 pound plus aircraft being hurled from zero to 160 miles an hour in seconds with all that steam. These young men and women do it day in, day out, good weather and bad, and it is just a testament to their professionalism. Here you've got the F-14 rotating off. Here you've got some steam making its way back, and then the scene ends with the trusty A-7 coming into land. Now over here to the right, I can't quite tell, but here's some aircraft. No, that's a single tail. So whether there were some F-18s on there or not that day, I don't know. I don't really see any in this footage. These are all F-14s. Those are F-14s. These are F-14s. There could have been some way up on the bow, but in the early 80s to mid 80s, there weren't that many yet. So it's possible that they were just not out there that day or in this particular air wing. And at that point, it moves over to the footage of them going inside the Combat Information Center. Well, that will do it for this behind the scenes. I want to remind you that if you enjoy these scenes and our episodes, you can subscribe and they will show up automatically in your feed. And as well, our Fighter Pilot Podcast Patreon page is a place you can go and get earlier access to episodes such as this. And you can also gain access to exclusive content based on how much you decide to support the show. We've got everything from the flight student all the way down to the air boss, and you might gain access to unedited interviews. We might even have trailers and a little bit of extra audio video from us recording. And we even send, in some cases, shirts, stickers, magnets, and other goodies. So if that interests you, head on over to patreon.com, search Fighter Pilot Podcast, and think about subscribing. We have a lot of activity going on and a lot of folks helping keep this show going. Well, that'll do it for this Behind the Scenes brought to you by BVR Productions. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. See ya.